Spilling the Beans Digital Health Podcast is aimed at members of the digital health community globally, with guests from the United Kingdom, Australia and the United States. The podcast is available through all major podcast distributors as well as on YouTube. The show is sponsored by Woodrow Mercer Technology and Woodrow Mercer Digital Health. Hi guys, uh, thanks very much for joining us again for Spill the Beans. So uh, my guest this week is Guy Gross, who's a consultant at Lang Buisson. Um, they're a digital health business. We'll go into them obviously in a, a lot more detail in a second, but basically they're involved in the, um, the social care aspects of uh, the health tech industry. Um, they have got a bit of a gap in the market, um, I guess, in, in terms of what's not being done and what's not being offered, and they're trying to sort of bridge that gap um, within the social care um, industry through technology. So uh, really important work that they're doing and really interesting to listen to. Guy has got uh, extensive experience in health tech before it was a buzzword. Um, he has been... Um, on the advisory board for the Institution of Engineering and Technology, uh, specifically related to healthcare, uh, which has 168,000 members in 150 countries. Um, you know, he's worked in a variety of accelerators and, and incubators. Um, he's been given lectures uh, lectures in the past on on NHS structures and, and innovation. Um, really really you know knowledgeable and interesting guy and interesting to hear his thoughts on the health tech industry as a whole so really enjoyed the chat that i had with him and i hope you guys do too great guy well thank you very much uh for joining me how's uh, how's everything going uh it's been i mean it's a beautiful sunny day it's my birthday so i'm enjoying happy being, birthday uh yeah it's been lovely and and uh it's been a, a day of downtime given four weeks of just solid graft so it's nice to not be uh Good. constantly on it for a day not a bad way on a weekday to spend your birthday at least anyway yeah, it's great. Uh, how's uh, how's the working from home situation going for you then is it um what's the what's the whereabouts in the world are you at the moment oh, i'm based in london uh it's a two-bed apartment i've got a partner here and uh she works pretty full on as well. So uh, we learned very, very early on we needed to set up two workstations in very different rooms <laughs> and uh, have signals as to when we're going to be busy because I think that was probably the hardest thing to get get through. Uh, we're yeah, both quite loud on calls. <laughs> definitely, definitely. I've uh, You see a different side to your partner, I think, when you don't normally see them during the day. So it's an interesting, uh, interesting concept. But I've secured a, a nice spot in the house overlooking the... Uh, the Heath. You know, I'm down in Blackheath uh, in London, so it's nice to be able to look out the window uh, from here. So I'm quite lucky. Um, great. So, and then I, I suppose from like a professional perspective, I mean, how's everything going uh, with yourself? I mean, if you could just tell us a little bit more about you know your your business and your role um, within that, and how the pandemic has kind of overall uh, impacted your role, um, that would be interesting to hear. Yeah. So um, I worked for about a year and a half with Languisson and uh, I, I came in originally to, to restructure the uh, research department and have been acting as a consultant and done several bits of work with them and then the founder and chairman decided it would be a great idea to create a digital business and start focusing more on the data side so we were looking at getting into real-time data and social care um, you know we we're in a very pri privileged position where William who used to be the deputy director of the office of health economics about 37 or so years ago started the company and um, it's it's a it's a brilliant organization in terms of the market reports and market leading the events that we put on are some of the highest held the events uh, in terms of the awards are, are brilliant Bringing out a data company that centralized the repository of all the information in social care and allowed it to be reported given our position of trust from the providers, commissioners, um, as well as the sort of uh, suppliers to the sector and the regulators gave us a real heads opportunity to do something unique. So we were going to market come February to go and sort out um, this issue. And obviously that was a very bad time to go to market. So we mm. decided actually, where could we start now and, and start making a real impact? Uh, and what became very clear is we're seeing the infrastructure in social care is is fundamentally broken. It's been underinvested for 30 years. We're at the breaking point where the amount being paid by government for care home care doesn't necessarily cover the actual costs of delivering care, depending on which part of the country you're in. 
Um, and then we started looking at, okay, so what would be needed and spoke to a few care homes and found some really devastating uh, things happening. You've seen primary care moving from three to four visits a week to a phone call a month. We've seen, um, we've seen community care who for 30 years or so have been saying it's too difficult to do our job in care homes, dumping kit on the door and saying that, that the care team can pick it up and on a phone call be able to do uh, everything from bandaging and also watching to, to various other tasks. We're seeing ambulance teams who are saying they can't go into care homes in case they bring COVID with them, who for the last, um, it, they're not taking people who are over 70 into care despite having quite severe conditions that would warrant it. So there are really, really a lot of issues with that. And on top of that, we've seen visitors not going in. So there's this massive gap in capacity and capability that's been created as this hole where we already had capacity issues. And so my primary concern is that we're going to lose a lot of staff through the stress created from getting through this first wave of COVID and the potential of the disintegration of the space, really. We've got 37,000 nurses who are at their wits end in care who have been absolutely primed to go to work every day and solve these issues because they're passionate about caring for people. But the stress of being in that environment can't be sustained when you don't have that support plugged in. Mm. So what we've really focused our mind on is building a, a world beating team of people really who who come from a, uh, a leadership set of positions within the sector to solve those particular problems of a, you know, setting up to uh, equip and connect those homes to free up capacity where possible and to support those teams and then to enable the rest of the system to connect into homes. And once you set up that basic infrastructure as a spine, you can then really scale and build the sorts of technologies that we're trying to scale on a one-to-one -one basis, depending on who you are, you know, solving dehydration as an issue, preventing emissions, dealing with end of life, trying to embed this app or that app or save this training or, or help that person do this thing. If we don't have that infrastructure, it becomes the same old NHS problem of a single sale 150 times to different people in different ways. And, and we need to try and solve that problem now whilst we have the opportunity at COVID, where there's that acuity and recognition that we can solve those things at scale. Yeah, I mean, it seems yeah, like quite I mean, a daunting, like quite a daunting task. task. Uh, how are you kind of prioritizing um, that? I suppose is the use of data, is that something which is coming in, you know, quite prevalent at the moment? I mean, how are you kind of using data? And is there a kind of data science, data an analysis um, aspect to this as well? So the idea of building a repository for social care data is important, but you have to remember that in social care, only about 25% of providers are using digital notes. Mm. So one of the main issues is how do we scale digital really quickly across the sector so we can get better transparency. Uh, the solutions that are there now, I don't feel personally are adequate. So they're better than nothing, but they're not where they need to be. The idea of having a capacity tracker filled in by someone who doesn't even really have Excel even necessarily on their computer uh, and trying to, to get them to um, submit information that tells you about occupancy on an ongoing basis. You'd be lucky to get you know, once a day at five o'clock when the person's ready to go home, summary of where they are at capacity. And if we were able to get ongoing care and get care notes that told us about capability and capacity and on an ongoing basis, just from the activity happening in the notes, we would answer all those questions immediately. And so for a sustainable long-term solution that needs to be there, and we believe we can solve some of that through some immediate support of um, some basic care notes that, that are web enabled and have the level of data protection that's required, but aren't necessarily the full management system that's required in care homes. Uh, if you add on to that what we want to try and achieve, which is the integration piece, we also need to be able to think about how we take into account remote monitoring information, remote consultations that happen with potential examination and diagnostics, uh, and then how we take people from discharge and capture the information there and take it into the care homes and vice versa when people are escalated back up. So all of those are possible through actually quite a small infrastructure that if it was invested in would allow us to do things much, much quicker and more efficiently. And all those savings that would be realized by the system through reduced admissions, uh, through reduced life saving and mobility, uh, and generally through a better experience for people would be just fundamental and is not expensive in the scheme of things. Uh, I think we tried to scale the various NHS systems we have at 7 billion a pop uh, the last couple of times we've tried it. And in social care for for servicing more people, we have one point, uh, I think it's 1.4 billion, uh, 1.4 million staff in social care and 1.25 in healthcare. Uh, we'd actually be able to solve the problems of social care with remote 
uh, services and consultation for about 300 to 400 million. Comparatively, that's just a massive potential impact across the system. It's just a, an unloved area of social care and we haven't made those sorts of investments before. I just don't see where it's going to come from, but we're trying to sort out that problem and, and embed some infrastructure, at least at a local level, that can then scale if we, we begin to get some traction. Mm. And is the um, is the traction more, I mean, everything in digital health is under a bit of a spotlight at the moment. Um, are you foreseeing that this pandemic could be a turning point for you or is it just another obstacle in the, in the way? Not at all. Um, so all the conversations are about digitization right now, everything. The trouble is that you're going to end up seeing pilot uh, pilotitis. Everyone's going to be trying remote monitoring, but it'll be the wrong remote monitors for the circumstances and the value won't be generated enough when you do a long term retrospective. So it will solve some problems of COVID, but it won't have the long term value. And what we're doing is taking the opposite approach, which is how could we put tools that develop long term value be used now to solve some problems of freeing up capacity within the care, care home rather than necessarily reducing admissions immediately. Um, because I think for me, if you can reduce the demands of staffing in the care home and have as well, we travel time that happens when we have uh, the peripatetic teams going into care homes or going uh, from GPs making visits. So all that travel time gets, gets taken away through remote uh, ways of working. There's clearly wins across the system. The trouble is trying to get collaborative paying to happen is very difficult. We've managed to get, um, uh, so far it's 10 sites, including a home care provider for themselves to pay 10,000 pounds each to deliver the spine that we're trying to develop. And that shouldn't be happening. It shouldn't be up to them to pay for it because all the benefits of it, uh, apart from the freed up time, which is just trying to keep their staff, is realized within the wider system around uh, the prevented admissions and readmissions, uh, and generally uh, the, the, the ability to manage people remotely and save time elsewhere in the system. So it's very, very difficult because it means having to bring ICSs at a time they're too busy and don't really exist together with CCGs who are in integrating and aggregating and have their own agendas and priorities around PPE and solving the people problems. When in fact, now's the time we need to be embedding the infrastructure uh, and, and doing it as, as best we can, but relatively cheaply to really be able to scale things. Yeah. Um, so there's this real- It seems like something which should have, you know, obviously the ideal scenario for this would have been five years ago, 10 years ago. And then, you know, the whole landscape might be quite different at the moment. It definitely seems like a, you know, I suppose a product or, you know, an, an infrastructure which is, is quite mandatory and is, is, is an unavoidable issue and something which hits quite close to home for all of us, really. Um, I mean, is there anything else within, what would you like to see, I suppose, from the other, you know, digital health members, the, you know, the community, is there, is there any kind of API aspect to, to your product? And do you think that, you know, integrating your, your platform and your, in your database with another product would be a step in the right direction? Or is there simply no one out there who's kind of taking the approach that, that Languisan are? No, so no one's taken the approach of building that spine that sits in social care. Um, there are regions which try and do it uniquely to them, which is the usual approach and is going to end up with the same problems in social care as we have in health, which multiplies the costs and it means you can't change things at scale. So for me, we have to try and do this properly. And the way that we plan to do it is by having a way of working with as many of the most appropriate devices, apps, services that, that fit the criteria of what we're trying to do. So remote consultation, including examination hardware, remote diagnostics, but including the ability to do blood pressure without necessarily having a cuff and going into a room to manage it. Uh, being able to have care notes that enable you to um, take information at the point of care, but be web enabled so that anyone can use them and they're very, uh, very clearly um, intuitive for the individuals on the floor. So there's not a, a workload that's required or a massive training uh, requirement. And there are those care notes have been designed that way across the sector. We have a, we have a unified organization called Casper. Uh, we're, we're looking at standards there and various other things to, to create repositories of information. Uh, but that's not unified across the whole sector. There are still outliers there in terms of people who don't take part, who are big players in the space. So there is still some issues from the supply mm. side. Where do you think that unification Where could come from? Unification could come from? Uh, I think if there was a mandate in place, that could help, um, but that's unlikely. Uh, there is the support of NHSX. There is the support of uh, digital social care. 
which is the industry bodies together with NHS uh, X and digital. So there's a, there's a whole raft of initiatives, but initiatives um, require a lot more buy-in to scale properly. And I think that there's a lot of chatter that goes on when there isn't urgency. And the fortunate thing is that with COVID, there's been an urgency developed where we're seeing initiatives created and dealt with very quickly uh, at scale. But I'm not necessarily certain that it's resulting in the impact that it could have had if it were, were thought through a little bit more rather than trying to rush to solve the problem while COVID is around. Uh, I don't see a way around it. You haven't got that. You know, we, we haven't had the urgency without COVID. And now we have COVID. We've got to rush because we, otherwise we know we're going to run out of time to, to make these things happen, uh, especially while there's extra money sloshing around in the system to try and get innovations to happen. So there's, there's this other problem of everyone leaping on the innovation money that's there immediately. So if you're someone making a decision about which innovation, where and when, it's very cloudy based on the articulation of the solutions that people are trying to push. You can't weigh them one against the other very easily. Um, and you can't really know unless you're very clear and articulate on what your specific problem is on which solution is going to match it best. Yeah, exactly. Well, there's lots to talk about, obviously. But um, yeah, thank you very much for taking the time to uh, to discuss this with me. And uh, I hope you enjoy the rest of your birthday. Um, and um, how can people get in contact with you if they've got any other questions? Uh, they can reach me at guy.gross at languisson.com. Uh, they can speak to you and uh, if you deem appropriate, I'm happy you pass on my yeah, number. Uh, and uh, I think I think you could find me through the Languisson website. So the, the best way forward is probably to go through them or how they say happy to go through. Perfect. Well, thank you very much and uh, enjoy the rest of your birthday. Thank you very much. Nice to meet you. So that's a wrap for us today then, guys. Thanks so much to Guy for taking the time to chat with me. Really interesting to obviously hear about the social care aspect of the digital health industry. Um, obviously highlights how much work there is still to be done as well as all the good work that we're doing. So yeah, really interesting to hear from him. Um, if you do have any further questions, you can obviously get in touch through the Lang Buisson website. I've made that available for it in the summary of this podcast. And yeah, if you do have any questions for me, obviously feel free to get in touch my contact details there as well. Otherwise, stay healthy, stay safe, and I'll see you for the next one. Cheers.